So Isaiah chapter 9, and look with me in verse 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. You know, a songwriter wrote, there's just something about that name. Yes. Yes, amen. And that's what I want to look at this morning. There's just something about his name. Amen. Yes. Let's pray. Father, I'm a blessed man. Blessed to know you in the forgiveness of sins. Yes, amen. Father, I thank you that you made yourself known to me way up yonder in North Pole, Alaska. God saving my dear wife. Bringing the gospel home. And now what a privilege, Lord, to handle your word and speak to your people, these people. And uh, Father, I pray that you'll bless and have your way. Help me this morning. Holy Spirit, help me. I can't do it without you. And I pray that you'll, that, uh, he'll communicate this truth to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, some of you probably are thinking right now, Brother Ed, it's not Christmas. It's not even Christmas in July. This is a Christmas passage. And yes, I would say, yes, I agree with you that oftentimes this is what is touched on at Christmas time. It is a Christmas verse. It is true. It's Isaiah's prophecy concerning that very first Christmas yes. in Bethlehem. Amen. But let me ask you, is there ever a wrong time to preach about the Lord Jesus? I mean, he's good anytime. Summertime, Christmas in July, Christmas in October, whenever we want to have it, whenever we want to observe it. And so Isaiah, he writes under inspiration. Now, you know what that means? That means that God breathed to him these words. And I think that's interesting. If you look there in, in, in verse 6, look at all those names. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Those are all capitalized in, in grammar whenever that. That's all ascribing something to deity. That's who he is. That's who he is. And so Isaiah gives us through the Holy Spirit some insight into the nature and the character and the qualifications of our great Savior. And I'm going to look at those this morning, all right? I want you to look there with me. I want you to see, first of all, I want you to see His perfection. His perfection. Notice that very first title. And His name shall be called Wonderful. Wonderful. The psalmist said in 118 and verse 23, he said, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. That, that Old Testament Hebrew word, for wonderful and marvelous are the same. And, uh, and so certainly the Lord's coming was a marvelous and remarkable thing indeed. And it caused great wonder being so extraordinary. I mean, you remember when, when the angels uh, pronounced that? When the angels announced, you know, glory to God in the highest and on, e on earth peace, goodwill towards men. There were shepherds out there. The angels sang. And the shepherds said, let's go and see. Amen. Amen. Listen to what he said. They said, and when they had seen it, the shepherds, when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told concerning this child and all that they heard and all that heard it wondered at those things which were told by them of the shepherds. So, I mean, his name was wonderful in the Old Testament. And when he arrived, on that, if you will, that Christmas day. And when the shepherds told those that were around them, they also wondered. He hadn't lost his wonder from eternity past till that very moment. And I submit to you, in his perfections, he's still wonderful to Amen. us. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Because you say, why is that? Because he wasn't just any child. He was and is the virgin-born Son of God. Now notice how it puts this. Look at verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That is his humanity. That's his descendancy of human descendancy. And then it says unto us a son is given. And that is his deity. His deity. Paul told Timothy this. And he said, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. 
He said, I won't argue with you about it. He said, without controversy. I'm not going to argue about it. Yes, it is a great mystery. And yes, it's wonderful that God was made flesh. You see, he was 100% man and at the same time, 100% God. As, as a child, we see his humanity. As the son of God, we see his deity encapsulated when God became flesh and dwelt among us. Ian Thomas, you know, he wrote that he wrote that great book, If I Perish, I Perish, Major Ian Thomas. And that was about the book of Esther, remember? She said, if I perish, I perish. And he wrote that book, and he said of the Lord Jesus and of this passage, he said, if, if Jesus had not come as he came to be what he was, both God and man, he had to be what he, what he was in order to live as he lived. And he had to live as he lived in absolute holy and perfect life to do what he did. In other words, if he didn't come the way that he came, he couldn't do what had to be done. But he did and lived that perfect and sinless life that you and I might enjoy today. No wonder he's wonderful in the eyes of every blood-washed, blood-bought child of God. Why? He's wonderful because he removed our sins. You know, the cults have always attacked one of the things that you can always identify a coat by, is that they will always and invariably, they will attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, it says of the church that we are the pillar and ground of the truth. We are the pillar and ground. A pillar is something that supports something else. And the church is built on that ground of the truth and that pillar underneath the church we are to hold fast to those things and hold those things dear unto us and not waver over those things. And so as being that, you know, what? The, how many of y'all have you ever seen the gold vault in Fort Knox? I've been there in Kentucky. I've preached there, it, you know, and you can see it from the highway. And it's just an unusual looking white building, isn't it? It's got like, looks like radar and stuff around it. You know, I don't know really what's in there. If they've got anything in there at all. There was a time when they opened it up. used to let you go inside periodically and look at it. And of course, you know, you have to, anyway, you can't have any gold dust on you or anything like that. But you know what, 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 the, uh, what Fort Knox is, what the gold vault is to gold is what the church is supposed to be to truth. The gold vault is the repository for the gold of the nation of America. And the church is to be the repository of the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. The cults will always attack him. You know, more, you know what Mormons say? It's a blasphemous thing, but they teach that Jesus and Lucifer were brothers. There's a book you ought to get written by Walter Martin. No kin to Brother Martin, I don't think. But Walter Martin, it's called The Kingdom of the Cults. And you can go through there and you can look at everything under the sun. I highly recommend it. The, but the Mormon church teaches that Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. Uh, that somewhere in the past, you know, Elohim, their Elohim, their God made a request. And Jesus said he would do it. Lucifer said he wouldn't. And, uh, and everybody that, that went with Lucifer became the fallen angels. Everybody that, that uh, went with Jesus became the, the, uh, the, the, the Latter-day Saints and so forth. And I kid you not, and everybody that couldn't make up their mind, they were cursed with black skin. It's in print. It's out there. I haven't made this up. It's not something I've contrived. It's out there. You can look it up. That's the Mormon church. Jehovah's false witnesses. They teach. They teach. That Jesus wasn't God. He was just a God. They don't honor the Son of God as being deity. And so they, in order to pervade, in order to promulgate their false doctrine, they had to produce their own perverted Bible based on a corrupt manuscript called Nestle's Text. And they have the New World Translation. Look it up. Those of you at home, look it up. I don't have an axe to grind this morning. I just want to tell the truth about my Savior. Amen. 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 There's only one Son of God. There's only one. And His name was Jesus. It wasn't Muhammad and it wasn't Allah. Amen. And it wasn't Buddha. I read something from a friend said, man, Buddha's been taking good care of me. And I just about... Anyway. Buddha is a, was a man, if he was at all, and his bones are in the ground. 
But our great Savior, His perfection, He is wonderful. Listen, church, we need, we need to hold fast to these truths. Our young people need to know that. You need to be certain of that. Your grandchildren need to know these things. And never vacillate, never deviate from the truth of the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Listen, if, Bethle if the Bethlehem Gazette would have had a reporter that they wanted to go out there to that stable or that, that, that building where outside of the inn and see what was going on there, do you know what his headline would have been? It had just been one word in big bold letters. Wonderful is all that he would have written about what happened out there that day. I want you to see his second name. Notice, not only wonderful, but look at the next one, Counselor. Counselor, this is a picture of his prowess. What does prowess mean? Prowess is one of those words that means he has an exceptional ability. What are counselors known for? They are known for their wisdom. Listen, the Lord Jesus has been healing broken hearts. He's been fixing situations Amen. down through time. And if you have a problem this morning, I'm telling you, Christ Jesus is the answer. He has the answer because he is the answer Amen. to all of man's problems. You know, the songwriter said, he's wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness this very hour. He is all I need. He's Amen. all I need. He is our counselor. Paul said, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. A counselor, beloved, is someone that comes along to give you aid. That's why the scripture says of him, he learned some things while he was here that he could better succor them. S-U-C-C-O-R. That means to render aid to us. It doesn't mean to do a con job on us like a con man. It's not that kind of word. But no, he has come to render aid. And man, is he not a shield and a high tower? Is he not a buckler in difficult times? And his grace is sufficient for every need that this life has to offer. That brings before us. And as a, as a counselor, man, he's my advocate. He's my high priest today. He brings all these things before the Father. And has sent us the comforter to live inside of us. And that's how near he wants to meet us. It'll be in that still small voice that says, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Walk ye in it. Isn't it a blessing? You know, I, 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 the, the devil must have known I, I struggled with some things this week. And, I just, and I, I just said, Lord, I just had to get over here this morning. I just had to get with God. And, and man, just and I just talked about him and, and just worshipped him. And man, he just... Oh, he just helped me this morning. He helped me this morning. Man, who is it that, you know, who is the one that's been answering your prayers and meeting your needs? It is our counselor. Our counselor. Man, I thank God for him. His prowess. He's very good at it. Amen. Yes, Amen. <laughs> He's very good at it. I don't know how long I'll keep you this morning. This is going faster than what I thought it would. But, but I just know this. That look at the next name with me. Amen. The Bible says, calls him not only wonderful because of his perfection, counselor because of his prowess, but I want you to see his power. He is the mighty God. The yes. mighty God. You know, Jeremiah said, he said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. He does have the power over these things. Paul wrote, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. Now watch. And by him all things consist. You know what it is that holds a marriage together? It's Christ being the center priest in that home. You know what it is that holds the church together? It's Christ being the preeminent one in everything that we do here at Ranchero Drive. That's how people get along. If they're not looking for the preeminence, we give that to our great high priest, amen. We give that to our mighty God. He's at the centerpiece. He holds it all together. You know, when they were able to split the atom, boy, what did they do? They found out some stuff, didn't they? There was a power in there. Who do you think put all that? That's him holding it together. Yeah. That pew you're sitting on, how do you think all those little molecules got together and are, and are holding you all up? What's well, just a piece of wood? No, no, no. By him were all things that are made. Yes, sir. And there wasn't anything that was made that he didn't make. Amen. His great power.
I read this this morning. Not this morning, but I read this. Adrian Rogers read this, said, in one drop of water. Now listen, you've got to listen carefully. Now, in one drop of water, you know, just one drop of water. If you were to take all of the molecules in one drop of water and turn each molecule into a grain of sand. Now think about that. If you were to take the molecules that are there and if you were to turn them into a grain of sand, you would have enough material to build a bridge a half a mile wide, two feet thick, from New York to San Francisco. That's the molecules, the number of molecules in one drop of water. And he said, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. You know, they talk about, you know, the power that's just in one drop of ocean water. If you could separate those things out, how much power is in there holding those molecules together? You know, I, I, I do think that, uh, you know, I, my Bible is not a science book, but I do believe it is scientifically accurate Amen. in some of the things that it says. And, uh, and so we see him here in this aspect as being this mighty God holding all these things together. And that's why, you know, the climate people and the environmental people. And I listen, I'm for clean water and I want places where I can go and hunt and fish and do all those things and enjoy this beautiful creation that God has given to us. And we need to be good stewards with it. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I still I still like that. Don't mess with Texas. Don't throw your trash out. Amen. I, I think we ought to take care of what God has called us to be good stewards with. But he has reserved the right to burn this up and it's his right alone. It's not going to be a melting iceberg. It's not going to be something else that's going to destroy this planet. It will be him when he's good and ready, according to the book of 2 Peter. And I believe what God says. He's the mighty God and when he wants it to change, when he wants it to be different, he'll do so. And he won't ask anybody about it. And there'll be no one to counsel him. As to how it should be. Oh beloved. He is a mighty God. It is his power. And you think about it. You think about the power. Hasn't he given us part of that power. That lives on the inside. That we can be vict victorious. You know some of the things that we used to do. We don't do anymore. By the grace of God. And the power of God. And there were some things that we were not doing. That now we do. Uh, participate in. And have a part of. Why? Man why are you still running the race? Part of that is the power of God. Working in your life. Showing you that he's still on the throne. Still working in our lives every day. You know, the Bible says, you know, after he created on the six days, on the seventh day he rested. Well, I don't know about you, but I think he's been working ever since. Amen. I know he rested on the seventh day, but God has been at work. I mean, who do you think it was that brought the gospel across your path? That brought someone who had the truth across your path? That's God working behind the scenes to bring you the truth. And when you got there... There was power enough to change your life. Amen. 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 So it's not just in the big things where we see the mighty hand and the mighty power of God, but it's also even in the small things. Just some little things that he does that makes a difference. And I want you to see, notice the next one with me. I want you to look there. He's not only wonderful, showing us his perfection, counselor, his powers, his prowess, and then the mighty God, his power. But watch this. He is the everlasting father. You say, what, what do I get from that? I get from his paternity. Paternity. And he loves his relationship with his children. This is part of why he came, to have that relationship. And we've talked about that, how we should draw nigh to him, and he's drawing nigh to us. Listen to what Luke says, and it came to pass that after three days, do you, remember, do you remember when his mom and dad, Joseph, his stepdad, and Mary, they were looking for him. They'd searched all around. And they'd actually left town. They'd actually gone about three days' journey before they realized, well, where's Jesus? Obviously, you know, he was a child that wasn't accustomed to getting in trouble. You know, because probably if he was, she'd have probably said, Mary would have probably said, here, hold my hand while we go home. That didn't happen, all right? And, uh, and so uh, he was there. He was 12 years old at the time. And so, and so he just, and they realized that he was not with them. And so, man, they made a search. They looked for three days. And where did they find him? They found him in the temple. Now, now, now listen, listen to this. And it says, and it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and ask and answers. Do you suppose that everyone, I bet you they asked him how old you are. 
And where did you go to school? And I, I think this is what he might have said. Sitting in the midst of doctors and lawyers was a lad. He answered with great wisdom all the questions that they had. They were amazed when they inquired about his age. When he replied, on my mother's side, I'm 12 years old. But on my father's side. I'm the Ancient of Days, the Maker of all men. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm the Rock of Ages, the Blessed Bread of Life. I am the reigning King of Kings on my Father's side. Amen. 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 On my mother's side, I look like any ordinary man. But in heaven on my Father's side, all power's in my hand. In all points I've been tempted, yet without a trace of sin... Destroy this temple in just three days. I'll raise it up again. Yes, amen. 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 He is our eternal Father on our on His Father's side. He's all of these things and more than what we need. And a father speaks about a relationship. A father speaks about paternity and ownership. And beloved, oh, He loves to fellowship with you. He loves to, to spend time with you. And when you spend time with Him, I, I met someone uh, for lunch this week and, and uh, a, 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 a police officer and, and uh, we were talking and he'd come from a Christian background. I know something about, a little bit about the ministry his parents were missionaries in. And we just had good fellowship and we were talking about some things. And I was telling him, I said, I hope I'm not taking up too much of your time. He said, man, we're just, we're just two brothers talking about the things of God. And I said, you know, the Lord's marking this down. In the book of Malachi, it talks about when, when men get together and they talk about the goodness of God and the, how it's not vain to serve the Lord and what a blessing it is to be his child. We just had good fellowship over a meal, and it was a blessing. And I'm just telling you, just as much as we enjoy fellowship in here, beloved, he enjoys fellowshipping with you in those quiet times. If you'll take time, listen, you know, some of us don't have our dads here anymore. You know, when I was building a house, well, I wasn't building it, but they were building it for me. My dad had built many houses and I could pick up the phone and say, Dad, hey, they're doing this. He said, well, you better ask about that. Better find out about this. Better find out about that. And you know what? When he was gone, I, didn't have, I couldn't make that phone call anymore. I didn't have that information at my disposal. He knew about so many things and I just didn't have that. But we have a Heavenly Father that will never go away. That there'll be no... No, th listen, there'll be no parting over there. Amen. Amen. And we can enjoy that right now. You have a Father in Heaven that loves you and loves to spend time with you. And He just wants to know why you won't spend time with me. We get so busy. You get so busy making a living that you don't really live. And I know bills have to be paid. you got to buy groceries. And, you know, you got to put... You got to put uh, gas in the car and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? How many of y'all know that song, Cats in the Cradle? You know, Harry Chapin used to sing that song. You know, uh, Dad, boy, life's busy and blah, 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 because he wouldn't spend any time with his son. And when he got older, his son didn't have any time for him. And he said, I'm, when I grow up, I'll be just like you, Dad. Yeah. Beloved, don't, don't miss the opportunities here. He is our everlasting Father. And He can meet with you when nobody else can understand. He can meet with you when it just seems the world is crowding you. What's it doing? It's trying to crowd you to Him just like for me. Uh, just like for me today. And I, I figured, I said, well, Lord, it's going to be a good day. I said, because the enemy's after me today. And, uh, and, and, and I just had to spend some time. I had to get over here and, and get some things put aside. Debbie was trying to ask me about it. I said, you take care of the recipes. I'm trying to get to the office. I was trying to get in there. I wasn't trying to be short. I just, I just, man, I just needed to see his face. Now, I didn't see his face when I had my eyes closed and bowing before him, but I, I needed to hear his voice in my heart speak to me today and strengthen me and encourage me. You know, and what he's done for me, gosh, I'm the least of his children. He will do for you and more. Why? Why do you suppose he saved you? He, supposed, he saved you because He loved you and wants to spend time with you. And we have a Father. I'm not fatherless. And if you've been saved by the grace of God, neither are you. We're not orphans. We've been adopted. Amen. Placed in the family of God. He is wonderful. That's His perfection. He is counselor. That's His prowess. 
and you can take your burdens to him. He is the mighty God. That's his power. There's, listen, there's not a situation that he cannot fix. You know, someone said, some clever person said that earth has no hurt that heaven cannot heal. And I believe that. He's the everlasting father, his paternity. And then I want you to see this last one here this morning. He is the prince of peace. And that's his purpose. His purpose. Look at it with me. Notice what it says. And he is the prince of peace. That word prince, do you know what it means? It carries the meaning like an administrator, like a ruler, like an overseer. He is an overseer of the peace. And it's certainly its last, but it's certainly not least. He alone has brought peace by taking away the enmity that existed between a holy God and sinful men. L listen to what this says. Ephesians 2 and 15 says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. And the last three words says, So making peace. He's made peace between a holy God and sinful men. He has made a way when there was no way where men could be justified and be able to stand before God. Being justified by faith. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says we have peace with God. And He secured that peace for us. I mean, do you have peace with God today? Do you have peace with God? Is He your Father? Do you know that? Do you know that with all certainty? Is the enmity past? You say, what enmity? Well, the enmity, listen, our sins have, have brought a division. Listen, sins separate. You know, in the book of Matthew, it says, Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, for he shall save his people from their sins. Why do we have to be saved from our sins? Why was that necessary? Well, number one, I want you to know that sins divide. Listen, sin divides homes. It separates people. Parents from children, it separates men from God. Husbands from wives and wives from husbands. Sin separates. It divides. Sin also defiles. Defiles the mind. Defiles the heart. It hardens the heart. That's why, you know, man, you know, some of the things that we read about, what... Uh, that I've seen in the news, just in, just in getting the headlines of the news, who has killed this person and how many are dead over here and who, uh, who was like a cannibal with this one over here. And all we're seeing is the depravity of man. That's the result of sin. And you say, well, I'm not like that. Listen, Jesus said, or I should say James said, to be guilty of one of the commandments is to be guilty of all the commandments. What, what about the commandment that says, you know, here's the first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind, with all thy being. And the second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. And the question is, have, have you done the first commandment? Have you always, all the time, loved him with all your heart and everything that you've done with all your might? And the answer to that is, of course not. I... I told the men about something that I read this week. Spur it's a quote from Spurgeon. Spurgeon said, don't feel, don't feel upset with that guy that doesn't like you. He said, because down deep, he said, you're really a lot worse than what he even thinks. <laughs> now we're laughing, but it's a lot of truth and humor. It is. Because it's true. Amen. I told him when I looked in the mirror this morning, I didn't see Ed Schoening in there. I saw Ed Tierbach in there. That was me. Needed to put a brush in my hair, brush my teeth, and all that. That was that, that was you in the mirror this morning. That sin, it divides, it defiles, and ultimately it brings death. The wages of sin is death. That's why we're getting older. Did you know that? Why are why, why are we why do I got these aches and pains and things I'm having to be poked and prodded and measured and a consulted and all this kind of why we're getting older it's not just it's not just the cycle of life it people are aging they're dying because of sin this is why people are dying 
We just don't think about it in those terms. We just figure it's the, every day. I get a, I, every day I get a, an update from the Daily Times here about the obituaries, and I look to see. I look to make sure that first of all, it's not any of you all. Amen. I look there, and it's not anybody else I've met in town or whatever. I feel bad about that, but I look at it every day. I mean, I, I get it every day. I look at it every day. They publish it every day. It's a reminder every day. I pass that cemetery on the hill right there, Mountain View Cemetery. It's a reminder that's the wages of sin is death. We're not 12 years old anymore. We're not 15 years old. We're not 25. We're not, we're not 70 anymore. Some of us, not 70 anymore. The finish line is drawing near and we're dying. This body is dying because of sin. And there's no cure for it. How many of y'all know who Robert Oppenheimer is? You heard that name. Brother Larry knows. He was a part of the creator and supervisor. He supervised the creation and development of the first atomic bomb. And after, I think after the test of it, or after they dropped it, he was summoned before a congressional committee. This is a true story. And they asked him, they, they were inquiring of him if there was any defense against the weapon. They called it the gadget. Was there any defense? <coughs> and Dr. Oppenheimer, Dr. Oppenheimer said, certainly. And then he paused. And they said, well, and that is? Oppenheimer looked over the hushed, expectant audience and said softly, peace is the only defense against the weapon. And beloved, peace with God is the only defense against death. Because it's coming. It's coming for every one of us. Whether we be young or old. David said there's just a footstep between me and death. For us, they're just a heartbeat. Just a heartbeat. I don't know when that day is going to be. I just know that everybody in here has an appointment. And it's going to be met. You can't put it off. You can't delay it. If you live foolishly, you can speed it up. But you can't stop it. Only the Lord Jesus can provide what you need. That's why he's the Prince of Peace. You see, that was his purpose. You see his perfection. He was wonderful. His prowess. He is a counselor, can render aid. Show me, point me in the right direction through his word. He is that mighty God. He has the power to change life. Maybe you struggle with something. I don't know. I've been dealing with this all my life. No, he has the power to change it. He really does. He's the everlasting Father. He wants that relationship with you. Looking for it. Loving it. Listen, the Bible says He endured the cross, despising the shame. But it says, but for the joy that was set before Him. Why? He knew some things good were going to happen. He wants that relationship with you. And He will provide the peace. The peace. That's His purpose. Do you know Him today? Have you taken care of this matter of death? That's why when Paul wrote, when Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians over there in chapter 15, he said, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? He said, The strength of the he said, the sting of death is sin. Sin. Boy, have it taken care of. You can have it taken care of today if you'll call upon him, if you'll trust him. Death has no defense. Only peace with God through Jesus Christ will do it. Let's stand. Heads bows, eyes closed. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me? We're going to pray. Sister Debbie's going to play. We're going to have an invitation. It's just an opportunity for you to respond to the message. When people come to the altar or the, however this is, wherever they need it, it doesn't always mean that you're guilty of something. Sometimes people are just kneeling because they're grateful. Sometimes, sometimes they don't have one thing that they need. They just want to tell God thank you and that they love you.
Boy, isn't there something about His name? Amen. It is so full of what we have. Father, I've done my best to deliver what You put on my heart, and I thank You, Lord, for it. I thank You, dear God, that You are all those things and a whole lot more. John said the libraries of the world couldn't contain all the books that could have been written about the Lord Jesus and what He did and no doubt in what He said. But Lord, these things, You wrote them, these things that are in our Bible, You wrote them that we might believe and then believing that we would have eternal life. I pray for that soul that's here nearest to eternity. If there's someone here today, Lord, that does not know You, I pray You'll show them, Father. I pray, God, that You'll break through their pride, that they may see themselves as You see them, and that, that today they may trust You. We love you and we thank you, Lord, and we need you. And we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.